Hello, my name is Carol Minkiti, and I have the honor of welcoming you all here. I'm the wife of Ifanya Minkiti, who died almost four years ago, but and now our family owns the store, <laughs> me and my four children. So uh, we love the place as much as he did, but he really loved this place. He thought it was sacred, and I'm sure he would welcome all of you with his open heart. I do, though, want to acknowledge these two amazing interns we've just had from Bennington. Star is one of them, but the uh, Lily <laughs> and Lily had to leave to go back to Bennington for the weekend. So she had to leave just a few minutes ago. You missed seeing her. So um, we're very lucky to have interns every year from Burning Bennington. And we don't have to pay them a thing. They just mm -hmm donate them to us but we've really been fortunate this time to have two wonderful interns and also we have an amazing manager james so i shout out with him. and we have a wonderful reading tonight and looking forward to that so much so welcome to the poets and to the people who are on zoom there's quite a few people on zoom Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm Ezra Fox, I'm the senior editor of Aerosmith Press. Um, and we're just so grateful to be here, especially after canceling a couple of weeks ago due to cold, uh, that you all have come here to this cozy spot uh, to uh, during this uh, rain and sleet and all, and all that as well. So, um, and I wanna say uh, to, to you, we, we remember your husband very well and he always lit up any room he was in, his energy and his love for poetry and books. And he, he believed in, in Aerosmith and what we were doing as well. So thank you for your work. I also want to thank uh, the staff at Grolier, especially James, um, who really, um, you know, you're our hosts and our partners in, in poetry here. Um, so I uh, hope you learn more about the Grolier. It's, if you don't know, it's uh, hallowed, hallowed uh, walls here. Um, I'm humbled to introduce our first reader. Kyth Heller's Firebird is not so much a collection, but rather a fugue of poems that usher us through a mythology of trauma and transformation. She writes, I don't want to feel, but how could I bear not feeling? Navigating this impossibility is the holy work of the poet. Firebird probes past what the author wants. Images echoes and echo and bounce off the inner walls of this book. X-rays that reveal and obscure, mattresses burning and smoldering, the body of a girl in ruins and yet indestructible. Kite tells us a text is a mirror, the report of a crime. Exactly what crime is being reported will depend on what you see in the mirror. As Kaith reads, I urge you not to simply listen to the words and envision the images, but to feel that mirror of the text reflecting within. She writes, what is the light of the inside? Light meeting light, like mirror meeting fire. I leave it to you to answer that question for yourself. There's no other book like this one, just like there's no human like Kai, a poet, essayist, interdisciplinary artist, and scholar. She's the author of writing and intermedia works, including Immolation, The Thunder of Perfect Mind, and Rite of Spring, as well as film and installation works. She's the founder of Vision Lab, the editor of Forecast Journal, and she teaches in the language and thinking program at Bard College. Please join me in welcoming Kai Pell. I'm so humbled by that introduction. Thank you, Ezra. Well, um, many, many thanks to all of you for braving it out here tonight in the cold and the rain. <laughs> I appreciate all of your efforts and the love for poetry. Um, I want to thank everyone <laughs> at this hallowed place the Grolier, um, where I came for the first time when I was maybe 12 or 13, <laughs> um, slinking into Harvard Square, running away from um, my parents. <laughs> that was back when Luisa Solano was the proprietress. And um, I would write poems in my notebook. And 
she would let me stay in the corner and do that all afternoon. <laughs> it's really so amazing to think about now. So thank you to all of you. Tonight is also an incredibly special night. It's the one night in the year on which in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad's Miraj is celebrated. That is actually tonight and it's starting now. This is um, an especially fragrant and beautiful night on which the Prophet um, was born to heaven actually on the back of Barak, who was this mythological creature who had the face of a woman, the body of a beast and the tail of a lion, sort of a Pegasus-like figure. And um, mirage means ascension. And the prophet was raised up through the seven heavens, meeting all kinds of angels with super saturated <laughs> rainbow wings and finally um, meeting god face to face meeting allah and having a kind of mystical union with allah that tonight is the comm commemoration of that night so there are prayers all over the world all night prayers you know um i just wanted you to keep that in mind because there's an impulse in this book and which comes from the same kind of a source this book begins with an anonymous Sufi poem and um, it's actually about what happened to the prophet before he was taken on Mirage what happened was that angels came and stole his heart away <laughs> angels came and did a kind of psychic surgery removing his heart cleansing it three times with Zemzem well water and putting it back inside. And that kind of purification was the precondition for this journey that he took on the back of this fabulous beast. Death set me on the earth again, guilty of many crimes. In a previous life, my middle name, Letitia, Latin for happiness, was perceived as a cruel, spiteful joke. Life itself should have been enough, but she wanted more. She wanted meaning. And her given name sounded fake, like a porn star. Perhaps that is why she was punished with obvious zeal. She was not clever enough to understand a lesson more subtle. But that life is over. She set fire to the paper bird. She swung the flaming effigy through the sky until it was gone. Speak said death, that I am a child. Do not say you are a child. You are no one you have ever been.
There were things that had happened with fire before when I could not speak. I am not certain that fire is the correct word. The first was the burning that was inside the girl, then completely separate from her on its own. The second thing was a flock of skeletons, flaming birds. She was frightened. There were fire marshals signaling. This is illegal, they said. With enormous effort, I prevented myself thinking the thing inside the match that wanted out. And then, because I had to, because the fire could not be prevented, I wrote this. At the edge of the fire was a seam, blackened needles sewing a spectral garment she remembered and forgot. A dense membrane of blood reached the surface of her skin. The threat of underneath, completely separate from her, moving together in a flushed permeability. The flame that ventured outside the mind. I stood there not knowing what to do. Where had she gone, I thought, watching her bare footprints in the snow. When I remembered the scene later in New York, the image of a cairn of skeletons, dead birds superimposed itself on her chest. Her upper body, thick as a tree trunk. I thought her heart must be a nest. The body a cairn of curved space, the site of a pyre. Instead of arms, she had streaks of light. Nikola Odi Pogori Ogori what is the procedure of escape? Become invisible, not to risk detection. Pretend everything is normal. I was a girl buying a train ticket to visit someone in Boston, perhaps an aunt, no one knew the thing inside me that wanted out. Scritch. The body, a piece of sandpaper on the edge of the matchbook. The escape. How we are trained to pretend. It is only a match. It will not feed. I will not satisfy its hunger. I promise to kill it as every insatiable thing must be killed in order to live. Wanting to be found, to burst into flame. Devour. This book is about the phoenix, which came to me so strongly during, during the pandemic and all of the trauma that we've been dealing with since. Um, the phoenix emerges in every culture around the world at moments when we need that transformation, we need everything that's been dead to, to emerge, to come back to life again. And the phoenix is the symbol that exists all around the world. The Fang Huang in China, the firebird in Slavic countries, um, the phoenix, 
there's Saname in Iran. All these are different versions of the um, of of this creature, this amazing flying creature that has the dignity to die completely intentionally after 500 years in order to be reborn, in order for something completely new and un, unknowable, something of, of total natality um, to come into birth and to give us a new way of life, a new being. And so I was thinking so much about that and now about Ukraine and about Turkey and so many places where one's own death and rebirth in a psychic sense, which is a lot of what this book is about, it has this powerful way of conveying itself beyond a personal life. You know, we all have these various traumas and changes, but I think there's something so important about this symbol, which anyone can take um, and make use of in their own life and their own meaning, their own understanding to, um, to think beyond the personal into the collective and the possibility, this possibility of regeneration, of regenerative um, aliveness. So this book really ultimately is asking, asking everyone who reads it to find that point of aliveness in themselves that can come back to life or be reborn, a flicker of a shadow of a flame. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and it's very much also written for uh, burning girls. You know, there are burning girls throughout this book. Girls who, uh, you know, if you know if you you know who you are, if you are one of them, or if you know one of them, you know what the burning is. And this book is like I'm I'm hoping to seed them in places <laughs> like, for people to find. Um, how are you guys doing? Do you want to hear one more? Do you want to hear one more? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's sort of hard to read with the light perspective. Okay. She could douse it with a gallon of lighter fluid, light the match. If she could watch like this always, always to watch, never to enter, never to feel the brightness catch and the fabric searing. Look how the mattress holds everything the body refuses to keep inside, leak, stain, spot, and mark, but nothing belongs to it. How will she hold herself if she cannot hold this? The exhausting wheel of wounding and healing burns. Look inside the mattress, the suffering burns. The desire to heal again through suffering burns. I don't want to feel, but how could I bear not feeling? She's been floating for years, hovering somewhere above her body, I said. Is this the bed she must enter? Is this where she was conceived in a bed of fire? Wings lifting up. Open calling over the gauze of smoke. The dim hum, orange hum, coming and going over them. Did she know what knowing is? as the bed burned from the outside in, flames. Licking the edges, breaking off in pieces on the sand. What was the blaze that burned through the outer husk of her, which seared into the mattress, into every fiber of tissue and flesh to burn away what she was? what she meant to become. There where the wound is open, utterly still in its need, so completely still in hunger as the sway of yellows swell and fall over it, swell and fall. The skin of eyelids covering the whole of a body, eyelids all flickering, ready to exist along the whole horizon of, the, of its being, ready to exist. 
a unified weeping like the emergence of the soul. What do the dead want from us? What is the light of the inside? Light meeting light like mirror meeting fire. The body of eyes everywhere, a joyful sobbing. Everywhere, a crackling wash of cries where the glowing coals emerge just at the center of the fluff of ash and blackened fabric. Last night, I felt the flames climb in at last to the inner core. They found the wire mesh of the mattress twisted in its skeleton of light, its body of glowing cold in the black, joy or anguish to be born in fire in the elemental moment, to feel the, the flare, mm, flames coursing over my bones, caressing every cell with light, until at last the fire bent down low over the rib cage and reaching, reached in. My shattered chest was coiled like wire, heart, melted down to a single pore. Then that heart melted into the form of liquid pearl, which wobbled, flowed over and rolled drop by drop to shatter into resplendences of grace, scattered as seeds of life and as light rays. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. One of the poems in our next reader's book ends with the lines, where the mess is, that's where my heart is. David Rivard's Some of You Will Know is only messy in the sense that each poem contains the messiness of a full life. Reading any, any one of his poems is like looking at the map of a single city, but knowing it connects to the entire world. David's sentences stretch outward and take you along for a tour, and they do so with ease like an old friend who isn't afraid to tell you everything. In one poem he writes, I'm not the hero of the story. I'm only a man who a year ago woke from a dream and heard a voice, a voice asking the one thing he needs to be asked. What makes you think you can't be touched in your life? I don't mean to say that I think it was your voice I heard, only it is so much like the things that, that you do say that I want to believe it must have been you. As you listen to David's voice, I hope you will let him be your guide into the mess where his heart is. It's a good mess and it matches his good heart. David's earlier books include Standoff, Otherwise, Elsewhere, Sugartown, Bewitched Playground, Wise Poison, and Torque. He has won the Penn New England Prize, the James Laughlin Prize, um, and the Agnes Lynch Start Poetry Prize, and in 2006 was given the O.B. Hardison Poetry Prize by the Folger Shakespeare Library in recognition of both his writing and his teaching. Please join me in welcoming all the way from Maine, David Rivard. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ezra and Kai. Thank you so much for that. That was so beautiful. It's wonderful to hear you sing. Even when you weren't singing, you were singing. I'm terribly moved to be here tonight, actually, in this in this place. Um, I I started coming here when I was in my early twenties. I um, I think it was around 1975, uh, and I can, um, I actually can remember uh, the books that I bought on my first visit here. I, I bought Audrey Rich's Diving Into the Wreck, Tom Lux's Memories, Hand Grenades, and maybe Bob Haas's uh, Field Guide, which was his first book. And what? I think so. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I haven't been here much in the last, uh, well, I left Cambridge five or six years ago, and um, 
Uh, I've been back, I think, to the store only once uh, last spring, actually. Um, you know, the pandemic had something to do with that, too. But it was so great just coming into the store and immediately seeing those pictures. You know, that picture of Bob Creeley, the Elsie Dorfman picture of Bob Creeley and the dog, which is so fabulous. Thank you for coming tonight. And, and uh, James and Carol, thank you and for keeping this place alive. There's not much of the square left, I fear, you know? So it's good to have this still beating strong. I'm going to read a poem about February, even though we're not having much of a February, as it turns out. I think this is one of the earliest poems I wrote for this book. Where is it? The Hinge. It changed titles so many times, I actually have recognize it. Can you guys hear okay? And I hope everyone at home can hear the hinge. February's basket case sunset, fading embers when the fire grows cold, when it seems at last that you're likely to reap every cold-blooded and wicked thing you've ever sown at the proton level. But this is a twice-lived life, once in the heart, then again in the brain, or vice versa. That's just how it is, how inevitably it just seems to be April one day, the platitudes of our discontent fading, our hoofprints in icy slush faded, our home county woolens dry cleaned and folded in Mame's cedar chest, the snow squalls no longer a roof to live beneath, all that schmutzpink in the gutters giving way to a warm drizzle. The mist gathers like mesmer around an accordion and violin. April, the hinge between feral winter and feral spring. The tart citron color of the willows, a yellowish green seeping through their long branches at the same steady rate as the rain coming down and stippling the puddles. Not an ounce of vanity to any of it. That's how it looks from here. Listen to me. It's like when a dolphin swims up to you and lets you touch its side. You have no idea. <laughs> hmm. I think I will read that poem that <laughs> is reading from. Oh, how long, how long will it be that I get to feel this, this golden orb pinging in my heart? A sleepless 3 a.m. as right and as wrong as air now that the bug spray mingles there with Bach. So much vibrato in the viola now that the overwhelmed note has to hide in my head, bumping lightly against some thoughts, nudging one. You know how I'd like to lick the spot on your neck where you so often rub the scent I love? Well, maybe you don't. But if I were dying, Yours would be the last face I would want at the end to see. The archer, elegant and serene in posture and stretch pants, who brings gifts both kind and painful when she reminds you you have a heart. In the dark, I had been trying for a while to get at it. What it meant when you wrote, 
Maybe I could be the hero of the story, however it went. I am not the hero of the story. I'm only a man who a year ago woke from a dream and heard a voice, a voice asking the one thing he needed to be asked. What makes you think you can't be touched in your life? I don't mean to say that I think it was your voice I heard. Only it is so much like the things you do say that I want to believe it must have been you. The Believer. And so you make your approach. You make a beeline at the fairgrounds for a real attention getter, something like a biker in baggy camo pants, two eyes tattooed to the back of his shaved skull, eyes of stone cold detachment, eyes that can see how you go to him for cheap advice. It's dangerous. No, not for you. Impetuousness, yours, bright, swift, sure. It moistens everything. You're the one who knows enough to pray. Here comes the water, you told me once, a clerk in the waterworks when I was sent there to be brought to my knees. I'm almost with you now, too, here at the end of the harvest fair, the binding shadows of poplar and birch casting a cool net above the screaming and blinking of all those tossed by the tilt of world. No wonder the crows called to each other last week, constantly resetting the boundaries of this field, guarding against all the shaking and laughter to come. I was almost there with them too. It's as if for so long, my whole life has revolved around trying to judge the perfect point to say hello. I was even almost there at the top of the stairs when your mother went on screaming in the rain. Now your mother and her guilt out of all that is left sits down before a window to gaze upon the delicate play of a life set loose, your life. And crows, well, you've heard of crows, heard of them. To make room for air in his chest when he cries, a crow has to hunch his wings and breathe deep in the green field a green heat, a shrub, a blue, black feathers, shrugging, crows. They cry for quiet. And it is quiet. As though a pregnant woman had tugged a sheer summer dress over her rounded belly and come to stand here, almost hidden. Mm. <laughs> hmm. The wave. And trying as you need me to keep it simple, I can tell you that the bees were able at all times to pass safely through the glass, their wings rubbing briskly if needed as they moved from one side of the window to the other. Though the store sold appliances, not honey, 
used refrigerators and stoves mostly. So it was odd to begin with that hive. And in any case, no one could recall any more why the grandfather long dead had installed it in the storefront when he'd opened for business. Its combs dark as cribs, alive with swarm, dark wax, and the darker honey dotted by vast tilted galaxies of pollen. A tunnel connected a hole cut in the glass to the hive, a tube of transparent plastic, three or four inches in diameter, big enough that the bees could pass as they wished. But touch your fingers to that window, and in its vibrations you could feel a warmth flowing slowly up your arm, and as if within hearing distance of your breathing just then, often enough it seemed a bee would emerge from the tunnel by itself, a completeness of one, hovering, testing the air. And after a while, as you stood there, it'd feel like watching a woman as she steps into lapping waves. Low tide, a labyrinth of granite slabs she'd navigated through the tide pools behind her now, open sand beneath her feet. The ocean, a part of her day, she walks into cold water in an old aquamarine two-piece guided by something invisible to clarity itself, some part of her secret self. It feels good to have the ocean in her hair, restoring pale skin, some freckles, legs that seem to go all the way to the sky because the point of view you watch her from is that of a single spiny sea urchin hugged to a rock below. You'd been thrust into this life, you felt. For so long, you'd felt as if it rose up before you like a wall, solid, immovable. But you began to understand, it's much more intimate than that. Nothing is solid. You exist in the thoughts of others as much as you do in your own. The thoughts of all those who saw you. Even if, like this woman, it was only once. She'd glanced at you in town the day before while riding her bike. She was holding the top of her blouse with her left hand. The fingertips of her right steering the handlebar lightly. A button had popped loose from the blouse. And she was a little cold, but awake now. Salt of a wave on her lip. Trust me. The wave is not the water. The water only tells us that the wave is going by. I'll read one more. By then. By then I was leaving and the deer in the meadow had stopped paying me their mind. I was alone as I'd always been but twice as deep for knowing it now. Sometimes it's okay you have to wander a strange house covered only by a blanket, itchy wool rubbing against your naked ass and shoulders, a coarse gray fire station blanket given me as a child. I didn't know whether this was one of those times. I mean, I didn't know if I was okay. Shame thinks of us in friendly terms. It wants only to do us the kindness of anchoring us to the world it makes us feel unworthy of. 
I kept thinking, a good cry will take care of everything wrong. Getting day by day skinnier, but filled somehow despite it all to bursting. Do me a favor, I wanted to ask shame. Hold me, why don't you? Because at heart, it's just that simple, maybe. I wanted to be held, that's all. When I say the word world, I mean love, of course. When I say then, I mean now, always. Thank you. So much, David. Um, Umin Haruni's Unrevolutionary Times is a sketchbook of figures that some of you might recognize and a few of you might be. These are the revolutionary hearts struggling to live in spaces that have no use for them. Some of them languish in private sorrow. Others find themselves the most beautiful ones in the room. And others still dance and fight and fuck as if it really was the revolution, though it, it isn't. But these figures don't just spin their wheels. They can't help but move everything around them. Of one, he writes, who doesn't know that giving is a lapse in a long, cold stare? But when she danced light and immortal, we forgot the bitter searching of the heart and the quest for faith were mere distances we would one day visit in our lush boredom. Even her vanishings felt like a gift. Who man is himself a gift. Born in Tehran in 1982, he's a theorist of cultural transformation. His work, including his poetry, moves across philosophy, political economy, psychology, theater, and literature, culminating in his pedagogy of active theory, which he teaches at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I've also been deeply blessed to call him my friend and fellow madman for too many years to count. Uh, we're so close, in fact, that I promised him I'd say that whatever he has is all due to his good looks. Uh, <laughs> promises made and promises kept. So without further ado, please welcome him. <laughs> I'm always glad that you maintain your commitment to truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, last time I did this, which was the first time I did this, <laughs> I stayed very far away from the microphone. And then David came to me and said, you need to make sweet love to that microphone like this <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, no you didn't of course not. <laughs> come on <laughs> what, the cop <laughs> um if you want to they say if you want to make god laugh write a, a book of poetry and <laughs> i did it for money but it, it made god laugh because it's it's called unrevolutionary times and um it was about just that. And uh, the day the book came out uh, coincided with, I think we were only a couple of weeks into uh, the Iranian revolution, uh, the current one, <laughs> the better one. Um, so I'm actually going to, it's, I would have a hard time reading that without reading these. So I'm just going to read two poems that are not in there and I've never read out loud um, and they serve to uh, anchor me uh, in the moment and also they serve to make sure that uh, David is not bored <laughs> <laughs> he knows the other ones by Very heart <laughs> <laughs> tired city how sweetly you comb your streets in rain how slowly you wash your stone heart in autumn. Do not shed more blood to polish your walls. When it woke up, it was already rooted in you, this wild hyacinth, frostbitten and brilliant. That one was called Qasida for Tehran. This one is called Qasida for Sapez, and it's going to be a little bit 
um, more difficult to explain. All the quoted lines are from the funeral of Masa Amini, which took place in Safez, and that was the seed of the revolution. Um, where there is translation needed, I'll pause and just ruin the flow of the poem by translating. The sky is ill. Today should have rained flowers. The earth unfurls its robe, gathers nothing but dust and a horde of faces, gray and somber. Heat of September in the Kurdish valley tries to char the bones. They grow colder. Eyes sue themselves to the cadaver like she is water. No one looks to heavens, not for rain, not any longer. The body rests on a river of bodies. The current surges in quiet anger. But in that black center, they wear black and uh, the body is shrouded in black at first. But in that black center, the immense wailing of a single voice, the nails gashing the face, an unbearable sound growing louder Someone holds her arm, mother, 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 sentence without end, who can console her? She herself completes it all with a shriek, I have no daughter. Her body is forever still, the crowd shudders, just a few thousand. What can so few hands gather against those whose God is murder? On a hidden roof, a gun is already cocked. They gather the emptiness, fists into the air, margbar, margbar, deathly. The fists rise higher, margbar, margbar. I wish my arms would shoot out of the shoulder. They have stood here before. She's not the first, even if in innocence she looks like Eve's daughter, the first unnamed sister. All this shouting amounts to a whimper. Were we born on earth to become mourners? Seize the slogans powerless to arrest the fall of despair. The river of bodies has reached the abyss. Lay her inside, altar. By the graveside, only the sound of a few sparrows. Do they summon winter? And the words, the wails of the woman, Jean Aguian, wake up, people have come to see you, my daughter, breath of my breath, my broken flower. She crushes a rose in her hand, scatters dust on her hair. Who can console the distant? All that was close has receded farther. We will not surrender, we will not bow our heads. Who is speaking, her uncle, her father? He is the one they had to carry, back broken, his feet furrowed the earth where they dragged him. Do not abandon us, don't let them harm us. Voices multiply, strangers, neighbors, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, they answer. The words do not arrest the fall of horror. They know what he means better than their own hearts, but in that silence an old man's murmur, Tehran has forced a veil on trees. It has made of life a sepulchre. The words of Shirko, his name meant courage. He who speaks them is the grandfather. The trembling voice raises in the poet's words a mountain of danger. Deep in the abyss, deep in the furrows in the sky that now seems one open hand higher, in the blood-filled chambers behind the cage of bones where fear has its soil, a seed is thrown, it opens, has a whisper and greens on the tongue, and whoever speaks it is one with her body. Cannons, tanks, machine guns have no more power. Tell my mother she has no son. She has no daughter. Speak these words. Arrest the fall of sounds. What is this murmur rising to choke the crowd? What is the name of this backbroken anger? 
Already far distances are drawing closer. Everything tightens around the black core. Speak these words before you are no more. Stay the rush of sight, be all and surrender. And now to bear the good news, the revolution is not coming to the United States. Everything is safe. <laughs> Poetry readings will continue as before. And poets will not go to jail for reading uh, what I read. Jobs are safe. Coffee shops will stay open. For the it's also a long one. But you signed up for this. If it's revolution, <clears throat> if it's revolution, then it comes for you when you are five. It becomes the game that surrounds your games. At seven, it says, call me history. You don't know me now. But if you brush your teeth and learn your letters, one day you will. At nine, you study the faces of the dead, how they grimace from the war within them. And at 11, it teaches you poetry. One day it says you will be magic. The women in storybooks will know your name. By 12, revolution wants you to learn the city walls. You look into the eyes of the poor. Together, you memorize the walls. You take your first hill, scream with joy, tell your teachers to go fuck themselves. You are the storm until you look up, see you are alone. At 13, revolution rips your home away and you give it willingly because you want to live in revolution. But at 15 in exile, it is more homeless than you. Don't be confused, it says, I dwell in dejection. You believe what it says, you become ready to betray the cause. It has already betrayed you, refused to make you tall and lyric and true. The voices you need, it will not find for you. So you go to sleep. You're 17 now. Revolution prepares you and awake. Refuses you joy. So that at 21, when you finally wake up, everything aches. You have atrophied, sour. To wake up, you say, is the new revolution. You seek doctors and then witch doctors who turn your body into a boat. Aim your soul at the second sun, the one yet to rise. You preach, this too is revolution. Only those who do not create the world are alone. By 23, the witchcraft is in you. You read minds, and the ones you want, they chase you. Drinking, you do not become drunk. You guess the street names of strangers. You are a sword swallower, a party trick. No warrior now. So... You lay down all your petty powers to go find revolution again. The slogans like the loving hands of a mother release you. You slowly learn to speak for the first time. Everything is a thread you can tighten with dolls dancing in musical responses thrilling. At 26, revolution says, it's really okay if you want to have a life. But you learn how empty the comfort, the con. Every habitat proves you wrong. First your own flesh, then the flesh of others. First other geographies, then your own. But the sky too is wrong. In its heart you flail. In your 29th year, those you have touched conspire to give you a job. <laughs> it's not as if they know revolution beyond the tiny fear you inspire. And you see that revolution is more alone than you. You are its mother and you survive on this arrogance. You are the last underground paper, the pamphlet hidden so deep in secret compartments you can't find yourself. You always knew that it all depended on you, but now you know that it all depends on you. And revolution is beginning to take on your looks, your voice, and it is 30 with white patches of hair. What can you do? You want to hear revolution, so you begin to teach. It means you listen. 
you are a little lighter at parties, wine rediscovers you. The girls you wanted when you were 19 now come naked to your room. You are poor, living in a no-room flat, but so is revolution. It's hard to keep friends. Should I mention then you have lost your parents? At 35, you look down. It's the paper hat you made when you were 10, pretending to soldier. You look at it, astonished, and look up to see how little has changed. The slave auction is right around the block. Ah, so we can still lose our way, you turn to say to revolution, who is busy? Busy like everyone else, doing ads, rushing to class, reading these lines. You grab it by the collar, nose to nose, you see how old it's become, how frail. You shake him, look, motherfucker, look over there, the stars, speak the stars, you are the only one who can. Anyway, it doesn't have to be like this, you know, in this very order. But if it's not, then it's not what I would call revolution. How much time do I have, darling? Just keep going, man. <laughs> I have never read this one out loud anywhere either. And Kai, this one is for you because the last part of it, it actually comes from the story of Miraj, which I hate. <laughs> and as you were talking about it, I thought, oh, no, not that story again. And then I realized that I had put it directly into my own poem <laughs> with a lot of love, actually. And it's the, it's the last image. You will miss it if you blink. Um, when the prophet was taking off, um, the stone on which he stood tried to take off with him to the sky. And he tamped it down uh, for it to stay. And if you go to Jerusalem and make it to the rock, you will see that the print of the heel is still uh, there. Why do you read it? Huh? Why do you read the story? Ah, oh, this guy goes up to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> what does what does he meet when he goes to heaven? Anything interesting? No, angels. <laughs> no. <laughs> But there's, you know, when you look at it very closely, you understand that it's a, there's a, and there's suffering in it, and so it's worth it's worth it's worth a shot. The hostess. This is one of those figures that Ezra was talking about. While you tend your house, while you tend your house, no flowers will grow from the hardwood hardwood lines of your floor. Through the tall windows, the Alps enter and reflect in the tearful membrane of wax. The roof, the grounds, the leeks, the mites, the dishes, the thousand tasks of being the minor god of a small world. While you tend the floors, the garden snakes can only dream of the soft shoe slide on the polished open cove of the dance. But even as your eyes open their black wings and take to the faraway green bodies of Santiago boys, moonlight enters and leaves old scratches along the sills. Men crawl in on their bellies and roll to let their spines merge with the beams. This realm, too, is built to fall. But the lines of your house hold a prophecy older than Jerusalem. One day it says, the hostess may come to the door. She will open wide her arms, draw upward, lift into the mountain air, and the floors they will try to rise with her and will only settle for a few more centuries if she tamps them down in a hard farewell with her heel. Mm My lover hates this one, um, and uh, it's her fault because I couldn't have written it at all uh, without her without her influence. This it takes it takes off from a poem from uh, the Iranian poet Khosrow Gulsorkhi, 
uh, who died in the 70s, he was executed um, and was a, a great influence on my father who, whose blood runs through this. Um, he has a poem that says, I'm firewood, my good brother, uh, break me, burn me for the cold hearth of your house, for the cold oven of your house. Very revolutionary communist uh, poem. It's called The Friend. If I could only furrow the ocean, if I could only plant these lines in the hollow of its wounded waves, if only drown me, my sweet brother, it's time. If I were a painted thing on a wall, if I could only be the same constant offering until erasure, if only hang me, my sweet brother, it's time. To be an armor, the plow they beat into a sword. If only I could be the dust you throw in the eyes of a foe. If only. Draw me, my sweet brother. It's time. Well, it's time, my sweet brother. I hear you are cold. If only I were firewood, I would flare hotter than rage in a poor father. If only. Burn me, my sweet brother. It's time. If only I only could, only if only if only if I could, only I could, I could only if I only only if I could, brother, if it's time. One last one. This one's for Fanny Howe, but Nidia translated it into Spanish. And even with my rudimentary uh, understanding, I realized that it had improved greatly. <laughs> so if you want a masterpiece of a book, uh, all you have to do is ask me and I'll give you the translation rights for the whole thing. And if you just <laughs> work it from beginning to end in whatever language, called the Dervish. The postures I held for long breaths by the flow of the Ganges. I did not hold to achieve light. I held no star inside as I turned my body into a bow. If I prayed in my small American flat where every surface eyed my lips with contempt, I did not pray for justice, but for this stranger's voice to be drained from me. The art of war, the way of the monk, all the pillars of wisdom lie submerged in the brittle cold of time. And the current pulls their last remnants into the small enclosure of one last impatient soul. These profane lines I carve into the walls of your city did not dare hope to deepen your love but only to lessen the distance between one name and another. In this way, the dervish has honored the mistakes of his life. Thank you. Thank you again to David and Kai and Amen. Um, I also just want to recognize Oskold Melnicek, the publisher of Aerosmith, without whom we wouldn't be here. And give him that one. And he has put together a really wonderful upcoming season, including four very important um, books on Ukraine, uh, a bilingual edition of Helena Kruk's uh, work, uh, Lyudmila Khersonska, uh, an anthology edited by Ilya Kaminsky and Carolyn Forche, with many, many um, current uh, poets uh, working in the war and of the war. Uh, a book of uh, drawings by Hannah Melichuk, which is going to be a fundraiser. And in addition to all that, a novel by Richard Carney and um, poems by Sherrod Santos. So um, please look out for those books. Uh, I hope you will support uh, Grolier, continue to support them and the important work that they do. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out here and, and joining us. Thank you.
All right, before we let everyone go free, just want to say, please, one more round of applause for our wonderful poets reading tonight. It's truly great to hear all of you guys and the wide variety of talent and just absolute quality work that we could hear. We have books for sale from everyone up front. Feel free to come and purchase and browse the store. Um, before you leave, please set your chairs along the side. And um, is that happening, James? And that's everything. Thank you guys so much for coming. Charm of the place. That's true. Thank you.